The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. I'm glad everyone was able to um, make it today. Um, my name is Denise Bareilles, and I'm the directing attorney for the Eureka office at California Indian Legal Services. Before we started this morning, I just wanted to say thank you to our um, the local tribal courts in our service area for um, coming up with the idea for this training today. Um, Deborah and I uh, were working together and trying to figure out what would um, our local tribal courts be interested in. So we went ahead and sent a survey out to our, to our local tribes and um, they responded. We got a number of um, responses, but a common theme was that a lot of them were interested in material that um, regarding their tribal children in their tribal courts. So we ended up coming up with a guardian ad litem training. And um, so I think this will be really helpful for our, our local tribal courts. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for um, responding. We're very appreciated. appreciated. Um, and if there is anything in the future that you want to um, hear more about, please reach out to our office and um, we will assist you. And also, I wanted to say thank you to the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Bear River Band of the Ronervale Rancheria for um, assisting us today to put on this training. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. I'll take it from here. So I also want to thank everyone for being here. I know there was some confusion over the registration and how it was set up. So I'm happy that you guys have made it and you figured it out. You know, I apologize for the confusion. Um, we're all learning to have these webinars and work remotely and there's definitely a big learning curve here. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge, you know, everyone for being here. I know there's a lot going on just with COVID and with fires and, you know, there's a lot going on and it's hard to concentrate and get back to work. But I do appreciate you all being here and attending this training right now, um, given all that's going on. And, you know, this training was originally supposed to be in person and available online. Uh, we did have to move it completely online now because of COVID. So thank you everyone for being patient with us while we figure this out. Um, now I'm going to start off and tell you a little bit about California Indian Legal Services and myself. For those of you that don't, meet, that don't know me, my name is Deborah Avenmarg. I am a staff attorney with California Indian Legal Services. I'm in the Eureka office. California Indian Legal Services is a nonprofit legal services corporation. We provide services to California tribes, tribal organizations, Native American individuals. Uh, we provide our services at either no cost or low cost, depending on how the tribe or person qualifies. And we try to focus primarily on issues of Indian or tribal law. Um, I work with Title IV-E and non-Title IV-E tribes. Um, I appear in state courts and tribal courts on behalf of tribes. My background is primarily in child welfare matters. Um, prior to working for California Indian Legal Services, I have represented the Child Welfare Agency um, in two different counties. I've represented parents and children, and as, uh, as counsel for children, I've been uh, the guardian ad litem for the child as minors counsel. I've also accepted appointments previously in the past um, in high conflict family law matters where I've been the guardian ad litem and minors counsel in those matters. Um, and a very long time ago, <laughs> I uh, was a court appointed special advocate. That was back in like 2005. Um, so I do have some experience uh, acting as guardian ad litem, acting as a CASA. Also um, today, I want to let you know that we do have a very special guest with us. Her name is Christine Slett. She's up uh, with Del Norte Casa. Um, she has a very special interest in working with tribes. She's going to talk to you about some of her goals uh, with working with tribes and tribal courts in Del Norte County and discuss how CASAs and tribal courts can work together. Um, you'll meet her and hear from her 
more later on in this presentation. Um, so I just want to say thank you for being here, Christine. And I see you figured out okay. your webcam. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay, bye. Um, so I just want to keep things pretty informal throughout this training. Uh, Christine, you can turn off your camera for now and we'll get back to you more at the end of the training. Thanks for, for figuring out your camera. Um, okay. so this, this training's pretty informal. Uh, if you have questions during the training or if you have some comments you want to add or if you want to share a personal example of something, you can type into the chat. And um, I have people standing by. I have, as you saw, uh, my boss, Denise Borellis, the directing attorney um, in the Eureka office, and she will jump on and let me know if there's questions. She can also jump on and help me answer questions. There's also Mike Godby. He's from the Bishop California Indian Legal Services Office. He is also standing by to watch that chat and let me know if there's questions. Um, so please feel free to try to interact during this presentation. I know it's, it's difficult with these online presentations. You don't get the same interaction that you would in person. Um, so hopefully through the chat, we can figure out how to make this a little more interactive. Um, I'm just going to pause for a minute and just ask, are there any questions before we actually get started here? So I'm not you know, seeing anything. This is Mike. Uh, just for you to know, um, the attendees cannot um, unmute themselves, and so their, their questions will have to come through the chat. Um, just to, yeah. Okay. Okay, so just be aware of that and just type into the chat any questions you have. All right, so let's get started. Oh, I also want to start off by saying that um, I've always pronounced it guardian ad litem, and I recently learned that it's actually guardians ad litem. So please excuse me if I mispronounce it a couple times. I'm still training myself to say it properly. Just know that the proper term actually is guardians ad litem. Um, so that was something I learned in this process here. So moving on to my first slide, um, this is just kind of a roadmap of what we'll talk about today. I'll give an overview of garden ad litems and CASAs, and then we'll move on to important things that you may want to include in a tribal ordinance with regard to establishing um, a garden ad litem program or working with CASAs. Um, then at the end of this training, we will discuss uh, connections and potential resources for you for getting guardian ad litems and CASAs in your tribal court. And um, that's when you'll meet our special guest up in Del Norte County. So starting out, um, what is a guardian ad litem? A guardian ad litem is a person that is appointed by the court to represent the best interests of a person, usually a child, involved in a court proceeding. Now what is a CASA? A CASA role is very similar to a guardian ad litem um, in that they're advocating for the best interest of a child. And it's actually not uncommon that they be designated as the official guardian ad litem in a case as well. Many states, um, about 16, use CASAs as guardian ad litems, and that includes California. Um, in child welfare cases in California, the court uh, has discretion to not appoint a minor's counsel in a child welfare case um, if they find that the child won't benefit from having counsel. And if they do that, the court must appoint a cost of volunteer to serve as the guardian ad litem for that child. The main differences between CASAs and guardian ad litems are typically a CASA, their role when they're not officially the guardian ad litem, they're acting as a friend of the court. Um, and someone else will be designated as the guardian ad litem. CASAs are trained volunteers. Usually these volunteers take about one case. They're not professionally trained guardian ad litems where you know, that's their job. Um, CASAs also must meet national or state CASA set of standards, and that will give them some guidelines on how often they contact children, how they interact with children, what they can do with children, if they can drive children, that sort of thing. Guardian ad litem standards are typically those that are just defined in law, and uh, they're much less specific. Uh, it's also important to note that 
uh, you can have a garden ad litem and a CASA on a case, and they're both going to advocate for the best interest of the child. They may not uh, come to an agreement as to what that best interest is, and they may disagree with each other, and that's based off their different info and different perspectives. So just a good thing to know that when you have people advocating for the best interest of the child, some people are going to have differing positions on that. And um, just that you can have a CASA and a garden ed litem in a case. Uh, moving on to the types of garden ed litems, there are usually four different types of garden ed litems. You can have attorneys that are garden ed litems, non-attorney professionals, trained volunteers that are typically CASAs, and you can also have non-trained volunteers. So starting out with attorneys, typically, um, typically you'll see one attorney that will take a dual role where they will be minors counsel on one hand, but they will also be the garden ad litem on the other hand. Typically, uh, there's one person doing this when there's like a lack of resources, but you can have two attorneys where one attorney represents the child's spoken wishes and another attorney is acting just as the garden ad litem and representing the best interest of the child. Um, in those cases, you know, maybe a child wants to go home with their mother, um, but there's still some things that need to be worked out and maybe substance abuse issues that need to be dealt with. Um, the minor's counsel will have to let the court know what the child wants, which is to go home, but the garden ad litem has to let the court know what the best interests are. So they may say that it's, you know, not time for the child to go home yet. There's still some safety concerns. Um, so there's two different roles being presented to the court where an attorney is acting in both roles. It's kind of funny because they'll talk out of both sides of their mouth. Um, you know, they'll, as one person, they will say on one hand, this is what the child wants, but on the other hand, this is what is in their best interest. Um, also keep in mind that if you're dealing with attorneys as a garden ad litems in cases, that they have attorney client privilege. So they are not mandated reporters and they will not be reporting abuse and neglect if it comes up during the case. Um, having been a garden ad litem in the past, uh, one of the ways that attorneys deal with this instead of reporting abuse or neglect, they will try to maybe convince the child to talk to someone that is a mandated reporter about what's going on, you know, or if there's another way around it without disclosing any kind of abuse or neglect, they may just make very strong recommendations to the court based on the best interest of the child and try to get the court to read between the lines. Um, so that's one way that they deal with it. But just know attorneys are probably not, they're, they're not mandated reporters and they are not going to report abuse and neglect if they find that in the course of their investigation. Then we have non-attorney professionals. Um, these are people where their job is working for the court. They're either hired directly by the court or they're contracted by the court to be guardian ad litems on cases. These people often have a social work or mental health background, um, and these people are mandated reporters. Then we have trained volunteers. Um, they're typically CASAs. You can have trained volunteers that are not CASAs, but CASA is a very well-established program, and they're ones that you're gonna typically see out there. Um, and CASAs, they are mandated reporters. So you have CASAs on your case and they're doing an investigation. They are going to be reporting that abuse or neglect um, if it comes up during the case. Then we have non-trained volunteers. Um, these people uh, are typically relationship-based. Um, one circumstance where I've seen these in the past, for example, on a child support case where we have a parent that's actually a minor, um, if they're intimidated by the proceedings, they don't, you know, they're nervous about talking to the judge, um, they can request a guardian ad litem be appointed. And typically um, that person's parent, so, you know, like the grandparent of the child, you know, acts as their guardian ad litem and they can help fill out paperwork, help talk to the court on behalf of that minor parent. So that's where I've seen that done. So it is possible to also have, you know, completely untrained 
volunteers that act as garden ed items in cases as well. Um, also, it's important to note that the court can kind of mix and match some of these roles. Um, you can have um, just one CASA that is the garden ed item and they're the only person on the case advocating for the best interest of the child. Or you could have a attorney that's minors counsel, um, someone else that's the garden ed item and a CASA on a case. You know, or you can just have a garden ed item that's hired or contracted by the court. Um, so there's many ways you can mix and match these roles as well. So moving on, the types of proceedings that typically benefit from having guardian ad litems um, in child welfare matters, guardian ad litems for the child are very common. Um, you will also see guardian ad litems in high conflict family law matters, or that's a very useful place to have guardian ad litems. Um, family law matters could be anything from a family law matter with paternity issues, some kind of custody matter where they're trying to figure out how much time each parent should have, or you can also see them in an adoption or modification of parental rights matter as well, um, where they're supporting the best interest of the child. Uh, you can also see guardian ad litems or causes in juvenile delinquency matters. It's important to note in juvenile delinquency matters, minors counsel must represent the spoken desires of the child in those matters. Um, but there are, but some courts have found that it's helpful to have a guardian ad litem in those kind of matters as well. There are some cost of programs in place, specifically Placer County, Sacramento County, and Santa Cruz County, where the cost of volunteers, they do the standard cost of training, but then they do additional training with the juvenile justice system on top of that, and they can be appointed to work with delinquent youth in those counties. Most people think of CASAs as just working in child welfare matters, but CASA programs, actually, they do have the ability to expand their programs into taking other types of cases under state and national run CASA programs. Um, so these, these three counties that are working um, with probation youth is a good example of how, they've ex how CASA programs have expanded into other areas. Um, it's also important to note that... Hi, Hi Deborah. Sorry to interrupt on there, just chiming in a little bit. Um, I, I really like your previous slide and I just wanted to bring up that um, I know there's several tribal courts online right now and um, the, the gals would be really helpful in some of the cases where they, I like that you brought up the, the child support cases because we have a few tribes that are developing and already um, providing services there for minor children and child support cases. Um, I think another one where I've seen where it would be really helpful is in tribal eviction proceedings um, for elders that may end up getting in a situation where it would be very beneficial for a gal to be appointed to walk them through the process and communicate with the court. Thank you, Denise. So that kind of leads me into this, this other slide here. You know, we typically think of guardian ad litem as being appointed for children, but guardian ad litems can actually be appointed to represent the best interest of um, people that aren't necessarily the child in the case. As Denise mentioned, um, someone that needs assistance in preparing their case. We typically see it happen in matters where adults don't have the capacity um, to understand the nature and the consequences of the proceeding that they're participating in and they need that assistance in preparing their case. Um, so they, so guardian ad litems can be appointed to represent an adult. Um, and they can also, as I mentioned before, be appointed to represent um, someone who's not the child in the case, as I mentioned in a child support matter where you have a minor parent. You can have a guardian ad litem for that parent and you know even potentially a garden ed litem for the minors too. All right. Um, can anyone else think of any matters, any other matters that would benefit from having garden ed litems? Uh, did I miss any any kind of situations that tribal courts are interested in having guardian ed litems in, in their courts? All right, I'm not 
hearing from anyone, so I'm going to keep moving forward. I, I hope I covered um, at least the, the major cases where garden ed items would be helpful in tribal courts. So moving on, what does a garden ad litem do? They basically do three main roles. They're investigators, they're advocates, and they also help monitor a case. So as an investigator, they're helping to gather important information about the child and the family, and they provide that information to the court. Um, they talk with people involved in the case. They talk with the child, the parents, family members, any caseworkers. Um, They'll talk to school personnel, healthcare providers, others who are knowledgeable at, about the child's history. Um, they review records, medical records, school records, criminal records, counseling and therapy reports, if they can get those. Um, they also do home visits with the child and see the child in their living situation. They may want to take the child out of the living situation and take them place else to go get ice cream or something just to see how they present out of the home situation too. Um, and basically they use all this information to provide reports, sometimes written, sometimes oral to the court and give that feedback and information to the court. As advocates, um, they're serving as a non-biased, uninterested person in the matter that's the eyes and the ears of the child and they're gathering this information um, and advocating for certain things for the judge. Um, they let the court know what they think is in the best interest of the child. They'll make recommendations about findings and orders um, for the court. Um, they'll make recommendations about services they think could be beneficial for the child or the family. Um, additionally, they monitor the case. They're checking in on the well being of the child. Um, they're ensuring that court orders are followed. And if they're not, they will bring to the court's attention um, any kind of new developments, um, any orders that aren't being followed, any changes or concerns that they have. Um, and through this monitoring, they're also monitoring those services, if there are services in place, and seeing if those are actually appropriate and effective or if changes need to be made there. So why are garden ed items important? Um, Garden ed items are important because otherwise a child um, in a tribal proceeding may not have a voice. The court may only hear directly from the parents. If there's an agency in the, in the matter, then they're hearing just from the agency and the agency's perspective. Um, and but the child doesn't have their, their own spokesperson, their own role in the case. So garden ed items are very helpful to get that voice of the child. Also, the court gets better information to make better decisions. Um, the court's not in a position, when they hear something, they can't go out and investigate it themselves. So if they have a guardian ad litem, the guardian ad litem does that investigation for them and finds out what's really going on. Um, so it really helps the court look into situations that they wouldn't other be able to look into, and they can find out more about the dynamics in the family. Um, yeah. Guardian ad litem? Interrupt for hey, Mike. Hey, just a, just a quick moment. I've been informed that um, people are trying to ask questions in the chat, but that there's something not working. Um, I have received some questions in the um, in the question function, which is similar to the chat but different. So if oh, folks okay. ask their questions there, um, I I should be able to to see them um, as because I have received a few. So just maybe don't use the chat. Use the question functionality. So I can't see those in my presenter mode. Do you mind letting me know what kind of questions we have? Uh, so far, the only question that come through was was with one person um, who said they weren't able to hear you. Um, and oh. We've been uh, oh. communicating uh, with her about how to um, change the audio settings, but nothing substantive yet. Okay. Can everyone else hear me okay? Oh, she's Good. able to hear now, so that's great. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. Okay, um, so back to why garden ed items are important. Um, they provide a different, unique perspective for the court to consider when they're when the court's making important findings and orders about a child, about a family. Um, additionally, specifically with with CASAs, 
Um, they promote kind of a sense of community awareness and involvement. There's kind of a sense of community with CASAs. You're having community members help support other members in the community. You're bringing awareness to some of these issues um, that families are facing. You know, they're going to maintain the confidentiality of their case, but, you know, they're gaining um, this awareness that this is how some of these families are living. These are some of the issues in their community. Um, so it really helps build community connections, community awareness, positive support for these children and families. Um, so now what would be important to include in a tribal ordinance if you're trying to create a garden ad litem program um, and work with garden ad litems or CASAs in your court? You typically want to have um, something about your selection process and how how you plan on um, picking these garden ad litems. You want to include specifics about the training that they need to have before they can appear on cases. Um, you also want to include things about the appointment process and those orders, um, and also defining the rights and responsibilities of garden ad litems. Uh, guardian ad litems, they're given very special trust and responsibility by the court to work with very vulnerable youth. So that's why they must be very carefully screened, very carefully selected, and rigorously trained. Um, guardian ad litems, you know, they need all these things so that they can support the well-being of the children that they will ultimately serve. Um, you want to make sure that the right kind of person's working with very vulnerable youth. You don't want to put these children at any more risk. Um, and this is kind of one of the benefits of working with an existing CASA program. Um, if you decide to work with an existing CASA program, the CASA program has all these standards, the screening, the training, insurance over um, their volunteers, and they assist in, in matching volunteers um, with the right cases. So that's kind of one of the benefits of using an existing program rather than developing your own. If you develop your own, you need to make sure you have um, all these things in place and that they will adequately support the youth um, that are being served and adequately serve the youth that you're trying to serve. I just wanted to, um, Deborah's covering, you know, the different options of how you can set up your, your GAL or your, your CASA program, but I just wanted to comment that we did, there, um, one of the local tribal courts wants to appoint GALs and they've already expressed interest to um, when volunteers are identified they wanted to send the volunteers to CILS so that we could hold um, you know Deborah could put a give a training to the, the GALs for that particular tribal court system. Yes and that that's certainly something that we can do and explore um, and you know uh, we'll talk more about that. Courts should really consider what they want their training standards to be. Um, training standards are pretty important when you're working with um, garden ad litems. Um, additionally, uh, when you're appointing garden ad litems in your cases, there's usually some kind of application process and an application that they'll fill out. Important things that the court may want to consider is in matching candidates to cases is um, employment history of the person who's going to be the guardian ad litem, um, their volunteer history, whether they have a background such as whether they've been a party to a dependency case, a child abuse case, any kind of domestic violence, or if they've committed a felony. Some of these things aren't necessarily deal breakers, and some may actually be um, a valuable asset if they have some of these things in their past. I know that there are some really amazing, you know, CASAs and social workers out there that they do what they do because they've had some kind of past and they've, you know, done a lot to overcome it and they want to help others overcome come that situation as well. And they're, you know, amazing social workers or amazing CASAs. Um, but it's just nice to know these things when you're screening someone for a garden ad litem position. You also kind of want to know why they're interested in becoming a garden ad litem. Um, you may want to ask them questions on an application where you can assess their writing skills because they're going to be providing written reports to the court. Um, you want to see how they come across in writing. Um, you also want to make any kind of time commitments clear. Garden ad litems, um, it's beneficial for them to work in a family longer term than to have someone that's 
uh, going to turn over pretty quickly. Um, as I mentioned, part of the role is typically monitoring a family. So sometimes you want them involved for at least a, a year of time or at least six, six months, depending on the situation and the type of case they're being appointed in. Um, also, you may want outlines on how often you're expecting them to meet with a family. I believe in CASA programs, CASAs are typically meeting with kids about once a week. Um, some guardian ad items may, you know, depending on their caseload and their situation, they may just be meeting with families when there's an issue or right before the next court hearing, you know, or more in the beginning during the investigation stage. So it's important for courts to think about defining those kind of time commitments. Um, in the screening process, you may want to consider having some kind of age requirements. Um, you do want these people to be um, usually adult figures, 18 or 21, um, to support the child instead of someone that they're going to think of as a peer, someone that's younger. Um, you may want photo IDs from people to also be part of the screening process. If you can run background checks, or request live scanning, fingerprinting on these people. It's important to know, um, you know, what's in their criminal history and, you know, if that relates to their ability to uh, work with children. Um, if they'll be driving children, as I mentioned, sometimes it's helpful to get children out of their living situation to see how they present when, you know, parents aren't around um, or other people aren't around. Um, you may want to consider doing a, a DMV check as well. Um, contacting references is another way that garden ed items are typically screened. Um, that way you hear what people have to say about these people, not just how they look on paper. Um, typically there's some kind of interview involved and through the interview you're assessing their speaking skills. They're going to be speaking to the court, potentially giving oral reports to the court. Um, so it's very important they can present themselves well when speaking. Um, and also, just through the interview process, you can find out more about them and what kind of a case would be a good fit for them. Um, when it comes to training, rigorous, rigorous training is very important to serve the well-being. Um, typically, garden ed items, CASAs, all have a pretty significant amount of training. Um, you know, the purpose is to teach garden ed items what kind of questions to ask in the case and so they have the tools so they know what they're looking at and how to report that information to the court um, and to give them more resources. Uh, ordinances can specify the number of hours. Um, 30 hours of intense specialized training is not uncommon. I mean, 30 hours sounds like a lot, but that's what the national cost of standards require. Um, as a minimum for their program. And there's at least nine states that base their garden ed litem training off of national cost of standards, so those 30 hours. Um, in most states, even attorneys have to do an additional amount of hours when they're acting as garden ed litems for children. Um, but that can also vary, um, and courts definitely have that discretion. Um, when you're creating a training program, you also want to discuss, or you want to include the specific topics that you want your garden ed items to know about and have um, some information about and some skills in. And you also want to consider having annual training requirements to make sure your garden ed items keep up on their training. Um, examples of training topics can be things such as um, alcohol and drug abuse. That's something that we see commonly in cases, unfortunately, domestic violence, mental health issues um, of parents and kids, um, education for children, um, child abuse and neglect, cultural awareness, early childhood, child and adolescent development, parental alienation, gatekeeping, custody and visitation issues, especially in family law matters, um, just the court process in general of what kind of cases these garden ed items will be appearing on, um, interview techniques and information gathering. Um, interviewing a child can be very different than interviewing an adult, so getting more skills and in specifically interviewing and working with children um, will be very helpful for garden ed items. Um, garden ed items also could benefit from documentation and report writing trainings as well.
um, when courts are making the order for appointment, um, it's important to consider what you're going to include in that order and make sure that it's an adequate order so that guardian ad items can get immediately started on the case and so that all parties um, know what to expect from the guardian ad litem. So typically um, you should include the case number on the order for appointment, information about the parties that includes their contact information so the guardian ad litem can reach out to them immediately um, and, and exchange that information um, or set up meetings and appointments as soon as possible. Um, the order should also specifically state you know, what kind of issue the guardian ad litem needs to address for the court. Um, that way the guardian ad litem can tailor their investigation to those specific issues instead of getting a case and then having to talk to the parties and trying to figure out what's going on and then kind of maybe missing what the court was really trying to get at um, in appointing them as guardian ad litem. Um, also in the order, uh, make parties aware if there's going to be any fees for the guardian ad litem and how those are going to be split. In family law matters, sometimes the parents will split any kind of guardian ad litem fees involved um, and include the rate of compensation the guardian ad litem will be receiving in the case. So they'll have a rough idea of how much it's going to ultimately cost them. Also, including the rights and responsibility of the, the guardian ad litem directly on the order is very helpful. Um, it sets the expectations for all the parties involved. Also, from the guardian ad litem's perspective, um, if there's something on the order that says that they're entitled to get school records and medical records and things like that, it's very helpful for them to have that order immediately and be able to take that to the school um, or the doctors and get those records immediately. Otherwise, sometimes there's issues where the schools and doctors are trying to keep those things confidential and they're not sure who this person is and if they're really entitled to information. So spelling that out on the order um, is very beneficial for guardian ad litems in the case. When it comes to rights and responsibilities of the guardian ad litem, um, it's important that they're going to have reasonable access to the child, um, that they have access to the file. Um, they need to be noticed of all proceedings. Um, they should be served with all documents and pleadings. Um, they have the right to take any action available to a party in the proceeding on behalf of the child. They should have, as I mentioned before, that access to the child's health and education records, the right to interview the child and persons involved in the case. Um, interview people um, at the school, um, healthcare providers, childcare uh, child providers, um, any kind of caretakers. Um, and it's also important to um, also note confidentiality in there. Just remind everyone that the guardian ad litem is investigating these things, but they are going to maintain confidentiality and not be sharing this information with other people other than prov providing it to the court and reporting to the court. There was, um, I received an email question through my email, um, and someone asked about the cost of gals and casas. Um, I imagine some of them would be volunteer-based. I think, um, you, you know, the tribal court or the social services program may be able to find grant funds to pay for these casas or gals, or even funds to come out of their, um, their their budget for that particular department or court right and you know CASAs are volunteers and if you're working with um a a existing CASA program um you know there's not going to be a cost associated with having that person on a case and maybe christine can talk about this a little bit more um, later when we get to her part of the presentation um, so CASAs will be completely free if you're starting your own organization um, your own cost organization, there's going to be some funding involved in that and, um, you know, starting the organization, having the office space, um, having the case manager, you know, those kinds of things. And same thing with a garden ed litem, um, you know, there's going to be some costs associated with those garden ed litems or if you're having them as you're going to think about having them as employees of, of the tribe or they can also be contracted. Um, so there will definitely be costs in that regard. And as Denise mentioned, um, there's ways to, to look into funding those things. 
or any costs the court has, they can pass on to the families and you know ask them to split those costs too. So that that's an option. So now I'm going to get into um, some potential connections and resources for helping to get garden ad litems and costs into tribal court. Um, one of the options is working with local social worker students. Uh, another option is to create your own CASA program and work with um, National CASA Garden Ad Lodum Association for Children. Or you could work with your existing local CASA programs under the state CASA. Um, or you can also contact California Indian Legal Services. Um, you know, we love to help tribes help develop their programs, develop their codes, their ordinances, their MOUs, um, develop training. Um, so you can contact us as well. Um, so moving on to working with social worker students, um, a tribal court contact in our local area here in Northern California for working with social worker students um, at Humboldt State University, you can contact Yvonne Doble. Um, unfortunately, she wasn't be able to be here today. She had a a conflicting appointment, um, but she is very interested in hearing from tribes um, and she is you know, looking for more opportunities for her students to work with tribes. Um, they're always looking for ways to get more involved in tribal communities. Um, she's happy for you to contact her either by phone or email and answer any questions you have. But basically, as part of um, social worker students' um, education, they need some field work. And that means that they work out in the community and they gain school credit through their field work. Um, and you know, this program specifically at Humboldt State, they're trying to get more involved in tribal communities. Um, so Yvonne will be very excited if you call her and, and ask her about working with students. Um, the HSU service area, it covers most of Northern California. That includes Butte County, Calusa County, Del Norte County, Glen County, Humboldt County, Lake County, Lassen County, Mendocino County, Modoc, Nevada, Plumas, Shasta, Sierra, Siskiyou, Tehama, Trinity, and Yuba counties. So don't just think, you know, Humboldt State's located in HSU. They can't help us. They can actually... Um, look into providing um, social work students to work on projects in any of those counties, the whole Northern California. Um, and they do have online programs too, so some of these students may actually already be in, in these other counties and in your area. Um, so there's kind of two different options when working with social worker students. Um, one option is to work with students on a community-based project, um, and the social work students use their developing social work skills to try to create some kind of deliverable or try to create some kind of um, social work, you know, interested program out there to support the needs in the community. Um, so they can assist with helping tribal courts develop some of these things and policies and procedures. They can assist with some of the grant writing um, and such so that they can help develop a program. Um, they may be able to assist, it may be an exciting project for them to be able to, it, to assist in creating tribal garden ed litem programs. Another option that they're available for um, is to intern with the tribe. Um, when they intern with an organization, usually it's two days per week and they work for eight hours on those days. And they try to get a total of 400 to 480 hours um, throughout the semester. And the semester is mid-August um, to early May. And if you're working, if you want to work with these social work students as interns, they do need to prov be provided with regular supervision um, and job training. Um, they must have a supervisor that works with them on the social work background piece um, and guiding them with their social work skills. Uh, if, it, if their internship is for a child welfare related purpose, there's potentially a stipend of money that they can pull from um, at HSU to provide for HSU faculty to fill that role and be the social work support. So if your tribe doesn't have 
some kind of social worker that can assist in this um, garden ad litem program. Um, HSU can potentially fulfill that role as long as um, there's some kind of relationship to um, child welfare services, which can be things such as preventing um, pre pre preventing family law cases from becoming child welfare services cases, basically. So that early intervention, you know, if they're involved in that, that's one way to spin it um, to to get some of that child welfare stipend to get additional support for these interns in tribal court. Um, it's important to remember that when you're dealing with social work interns in tribal court, they are students. Um, they don't have, they're, they're developing their social work skills, so they're not going to um, necessarily be able to just be thrown in and immediately, you know, work as you would expect a social worker to work. It needs to be a learning centered process for them. Um, but these are people that can definitely be trained um, as garden ed litems to work in tribal courts and assist as garden ed litems in tribal court, or they could work with um, one person who is taking a lot of garden ed litem matters in tribal court, and they can help with the investigations um, that that person has to do and make the family contacts for that person um, and assist with in, with that person so they could have, so they could support more families basically, so they can take more cases. So that's one way that they can assist. And if you're interested in that, please contact Yvonne to find out more information. You can also um, click on these links here to find out more about the program. There's a lot of information she has online about the program and um, the agreements involved in hosting um, these social worker students as interns. Um, and she will be very excited to hear from you. So another option we have is tribal courts can work with the National CASA Garden Ad Litem Association for Children, and they can develop their own programs. Um, the contact you want to reach out to there, her name is Paige Beard. She's the Senior State Development Officer. Um, she has a lot of resources for tribes to figure out how to start their own programs. There's a whole guide to program development um, that's out there that explains step by step um, everything you should consider when building your program and you know how to do it. Um, I have that guide if anyone wants it. It's a little outdated, but I can provide that to anyone that requests after the training. It's it's very thorough. Um, there's also a, a lot of samples that they have. Um, in establishing garden ad litem ordinances. They have a sample that you can look off of. They have a sample resolution establishing a CASA program. They have sample policies and procedures, sample MOUs, um, sample letters of agreement between the court and the program, um, sample orders of appointment, sample court reports, sample service agreements. They just have a lot of samples and they're a good resource if you wanna develop your own tribal program from scratch basically. Um, so go ahead and reach out to Paige. Um, you can email or call her and uh, get more information. Um, moving on, there's also California CASA. Um, if you reach out to California CASA, um, reach out to Katherine Matthews. She's the chief program director. Um, she can help you get in touch with your local CASA programs if you're in the state of California. If you're out of the state of California, you want to look into your state-specific CASA program and reach out to them. Um, Catherine can help provide you with information on counties that are actually working in tribal courts right now. For example, Imperial CASA, they have an agreement to work with the Kachan Tribal Court. Um, so that's in place and you know she can put you in touch with them or um, you know give you samples of how they work that. Mariposa County or Mariposa CASA is another program that's currently working with their tribal courts. Um, and locally, Del Norte County is trying to figure out ways to work more with tribal courts. So that leads us to our special guest, uh, Christine Slett. She is um, the executive director of the Del Norte County CASA. And Christine, I'm 
hoping you can take it from here and let people know um, kind of what is what is your interest in working with tribes and how can um, Del Norte County Costa work with tribes in the local area? Um, yeah, so first I just want to say what a great presentation, Deborah. Um, I Thank had you. so many moments where I wanted to chime in, but uh, I, I wanted to leave all this information um, for you to give out. I've been doing this work for about 13 years um, in Del Norte County. And I know when I first came on board, the Yurok tribe was trying to start a CASA program and they had worked um, a little bit with the CASA of Del Norte. It's, it can be difficult um, for a smaller local program to get started because um, there's so many standards and compliance uh, regulations from National CASA and California CASA. Um, so, you know, that's what um, I didn't see it really take off. And my dream is that um, we create, for Del Norte County, we create a tribal CASA program within our local CASA county program or CASA program. Um, and the reason is that we already have a CASA program established. And um, what's really great is if you have a local CASA program um, that you're able to utilize, um, that then the all the training and the screening and oversight of the volunteers is handled by the CASA program. And so, for example, um, you know, we do all the outreach and recruitment we do the uh, application process we do all the background screenings and the checks and we um, we do all the training and we do case oversight with each of our volunteers the volunteers have to have they're required to have regular check-ins with their casa on a regular basis about the case and the casa staff um, were trained um, we're required to attend trainings and be knowledgeable about the you know child welfare laws and local tribes um, processes and in the superior court we're required to be trained on ICWA and train our volunteers on ICWA but that case oversight I think is a really big piece um, because these amazing volunteers um, what's really great is that they are very passionate about the children and the families that they're working with and so sometimes their emotions can get involved and it's really great to have staff to help kind of level that out and direct them. Um, in addition, uh, the staff also, uh, often attends the, the meetings with the CASAs uh, volunteers. CASAs do a lot of, what's a little bit different than a GAL is that oftentimes CASAs facilitate meetings or attend regular CFT meetings or family meetings on a regular basis. Um, in addition to all the other medical review and educational advocacy. Um, in addition, CASAs often hold educational rights um, for the child. Um, or um, if, the, if the parental rights have not been um, terminated, like is often the case in uh, tribal cases, then the, the CASA advocate would hold co-ed rights. Um, so they're not you know, limiting the parents' rights. And oftentimes CASAs are advocating for um, more inclusiveness for the parents and the families within the school district. Um, so I, I want you to kind of lead me, you know, what you think you would like me to speak about, because I could go on, I could talk forever about the benefits of a CASA program. I think the biggest message is that it's already a high quality program that's in place and easy for local tribes to utilize. Um, but what's needed is an MOU. So the memorandum of understanding, um, we are regulated, so we don't work for the courts. So there's not no, there's not a conflict of interest. We actually work under national CASA and California CASA standards and under um, the child welfare laws. Um, so we're guided by judicial counsel. And so, um, in within those guidelines from national casa california casa and judicial council we have a lot of uh casa programs have a lot of data um, tracking and reporting and requirements that we have to submit we have a casa database that we have to pay for um, that all of that is required for a casa program and so that's already in place um, you know with the local casa programs um, and then the training on how, you know how to do all that reporting as well. Um, so, uh, is there anything else that you could think of that you would like me to specifically address or speak to? So you mentioned um, that 
So, so let's say a tribe wants to work with you and they approach you and they want to work with you. You know, what are the first steps in um, getting that going? So you mentioned an MOU. Um, do you have any kind of samples that you could share with the tribe mm -hmm. and what, what would be involved yeah. in the MOU? So um, just to be clear, there's, there's two directions. So if the tribe would like to start their own CASA program, then they go to national CASA to try to start their own CASA program within their county. Typically, Judicial Council funds one CASA program per one county. Um, there are some counties that there's some CASA programs that serve multiple counties, but there's not really we get funding from Judicial Council per one CASA program for county. Um, but that doesn't mean that there can't be a CASA program started without the Judicial Council funding so that the tribes could go directly to national CASA to get that going. If they want to utilize their local CASA program, then the, each local tribe um, would need to contact their local tribal per, uh, program and develop an MOU. And so our MOU, and I think if I have sharing rights, um, I will pull it up if I can. Oops. So basically, you have a sample that um, you know you could send out to tribes in the local area, and they could you know modify it um, to meet their needs and, and work with you on getting that figured out. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the only one I didn't um, have on hand <laughs> to okay. have ready when I had to shut my computer down. But I can send I can send a so our sample MOU is with our superior court. So we have an MOU in place with our local superior court that pretty much you know it just we have to have an understanding of what the local court that judge. So the MOU is with our uh, superior court judge, um, presiding judge, Judge McElfresh. So he worked closely with the CASA program. Um, so the CASA program has, the national CASA mission is to serve children who are in the child welfare system due to abuse and neglect. So those are child welfare cases. However, a local CASA program can develop our own vision and mission. So our local CASA program for Del Norte County our vision and mission again is to serve um, abuse cases for child or for uh, child neglect cases for uh, child welfare cases. But we also serve dual jurisdiction cases. So if there's a child, if if there's a 300 case and a 602 case, we would serve that. Right now, we don't serve just 602 cases. So we don't. The local CASA program for Del Norte County doesn't. You had mentioned that earlier. Some CASA programs have in their vision and mission um, that they want to serve maybe all children who are under the uh, dependency of the court for delinquency or dependency. Um, so that that uh, vision and mission has to be developed from the board overseeing that CASA program. And so um, that's another thing to consider. It doesn't necessarily mean that there can't be additional programs within a local CASA program. So um, for CASA of Del Norte, for example, we've had, um, we have GALs that have worked in our under our program, and we have had um, we have ed rights holders. We have um, some tutoring program within our program, and we have like family search and engagement that we were working on uh, quite a few years ago. Um, so those are additional programs, but those programs are not funded directly from our general funding that we get for running our program. We have to find different fundings for those programs. So um, just to be clear, there. The, each CASA program has their own vision and mission, but they could choose to expand on that vision and mission per program. And so okay. that discussion would just need to happen with the with the the court, the tribal court and the CASA program on, you know, what their desire need is for their local CASA program. And then the other is the capacity for that CASA program to serve those tribal uh, courts. So for example, right now, Del Norte County CASA has 115 children under our local jurisdiction, and we're only serving 30% because we have to constantly recruit, train, and supervise those volunteers. And so, you know, as new cases are coming in, we have to recruit new volunteers. We have a lot of volunteers who stay on for many years, but this is a pretty big job. And so sometimes a volunteer may stay on um, for a one case or two cases and then they leave, or maybe 
um, we've had it, we had a couple interns last year, so they were there during their internship. We assigned them to a case, um, and then they moved on and went to a different job. So volunteers are always going. So that's a really big expense is that recruitment piece. Um, so it doesn't mean that Casa of Del Norte couldn't serve our local tribal courts because my desire is to serve every single child in Del Norte County who needs a Casa. And so I would hope that, you know, as priority cases come on and we have available Casas, um, I would love to see more trained um, Native American Casas, um, uh, you know, and uh, be able to work within our local tribes as well. So um, that would be great. So I get off topic. Uh, well, yeah, you started, you started not off topic, but in a different direction. So basically, if you were working with a tribe, you would probably want that tribe to assist in recruiting efforts so you could get, um, you know, the right kind of CASAs or guardian ed items to work with the tribal program. Is that kind of what you were getting at? Yeah, it would be, you know, hopefully there would be an MOU put in place and there would be some kind of um, commitment or support to help recruit additional um you know advocates for those families and then if there's any additional training that the local tribes would want for you know the services or the resources or how they want that casa program to actually function in their court then um, additional training would also be helpful right so in addition it's not to a requirement it's just you know a, a team effort it's just help it's just helpful you know to add those uh or to uh support those efforts Right. So you would get an MOU in place with the tribe, you would get it approved by judicial council, then you would recruit yes. appropriate volunteers with the tribe, working with the tribes on that. And then when it comes to training, you would add an additional few hours of training that would cover specifically working in tribal courts. Yes. Is that kind of the process? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, so I know that some tribal courts are interested in having guardian ad litems in family law cases. Is there any ability for Del Norte County um, to potentially work in family law cases as well? Um, I mean, there could be a potential, but again, um, you know, we are struggling to keep up with the capacity of serving all the children currently. And so um, it just, it would be depend on um, a couple things. One is that um, for, in order for us to serve more kids, we have to have the funding. So we have funding from judicial council and we write grants. Um, so we we have like a VOCA grant right now. We've had, we actually had some tribal funding a few years ago. Um, and so finding the funds, like if we were looking to expand the services for Casa of Del Norte, we would just need to find additional funds for those additional services, um, which we could, you know, it's pretty easy to identify grants and write grants for that. And we are in Casa of Del Norte is a nonprofit already and so um you know it's not uh it's not something that we couldn't do it just right now our our capacity is to serve children under the 300 ward for child welfare cases has your program served um in any other cases other than child welfare matters uh we serve uh, we serve dual jurisdiction cases, but we don't assign like to delinquency cases. And we, we've been requ uh, requested by Judge Follett in the past to assign a CASA to a family law case. But again, that's not under our vision and mission. And we can't, you know, right now we can't fulfill our capacity for to serve all the children that we need to serve. So we haven't expanded those services because we would need additional funding to do additional training to supervise a CASA in that different capacity. Okay. But it's not something that we, you know, we could definitely focus on and do it. I We've had a case that was, uh, it was like a family law case and an additional, uh, and it became a child welfare case and so uh we assigned a casa to that case but it was that was because the the judge wanted it to be wanted casa involved and so he took the children under the jurisdiction of the court so that casa could be appointed to the case um and serve in that capacity and so during that time uh casa you know we just uh advocated for the best interest of the children and it was more about you know, trying to get the family uh, to facilitate meetings and mediation and um, everything together for that family. But it, 
it had to come under the jurisdiction of the court for a child welfare case in order to do that. Okay. Um, are there any questions in the chat box? Oh, and um, there is a question. Uh, sorry, Deborah, do you want to finish your thought? I just, I was thinking um, now, Christine, when you and I talked earlier, did you say that there was some kind of um, potential tribal position with CASA um, in, in trying to work with the local tribes? Yeah, um, last year I, I was able to obtain some funding to, um, so my goal is that I, I want to create a tribal position in Del Norte County so that it would be um, a case supervisor outreach coordinator um, that's specifically working on tribal cases and um, providing training to our volunteer advocates. And so that case supervisor would be overseeing any of the tribal cases within the local CASA program. Um, the problem was that due to COVID, I did not have the, um, I wasn't able to hire anyone for the position. And so I ended up creating a different position. Um, but I am hoping, I mean, that's my ideal goal is that I'm able to hire a tribal person. So I would like to create a tribal CASA program within our local CASA, pro our local CASA program that is just serving tribal cases, whether it's the Smith River Tolawa Dini Nation or it's the Yurok tribe or, you know, whatever, whatever tribe um, it is, we would have the case being over, uh, the oversight would come from that tribal position. And okay. so they would also help with the coordinating between the two or between the tribes and the social workers and providing tribal training and doing tribal, the outreach to recruit more volunteers. Thank you. So Sonia asks, what would be the time estimate, what would the time estimate be from MOU creation to approvals to recruitment to training to implementation, i.e. how long would it take to get a tribal CASA program going realistically? Uh, so a tribal CASA program, um, that would have to go through the, through national CASA and that could take a long time because like we're our local CASA program has a compliance book like this. Um, so that could potentially take months to a year. But um, in order to work, start working with the local CASA program, I mean, it, it's just a matter of getting our MOU, which we already have one that we could use as a template. It's, it's just a matter of getting that agreement in place between the tribal judge and the CASA program about what our agreement is that we would be doing, how we would be functioning in that tribal court, and then um, submitting it to Judicial Council for review. And once it's reviewed, we could start, CASA of Del Norte could start serving, I mean, say that, say we met tomorrow and we agreed on what our uh, memorandum of understanding was gonna include, and then we submitted it to Judicial Council, they got it back to us in a week. Um, then we could start serving in that tribal court immediately. The only hang up is that we don't have enough volunteers right now to you know, serve all the children. So we would ideally need support from the local tribes to recruit, recruit more volunteers and they would go through the local CASA program to do their screening and their training and then we would appoint them to the case. Okay, so recruiting is kind of one of the, the big pieces you need right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, cause well, We've had, I mean, because we have, obviously, we have tribal cases that are within our local tribal superior court, and we assign causes to those cases all the time. But again, we, we have a priority wait list of 16 children right now. So um, that recruitment piece, to, you know, to help with that is a really big piece. We need more volunteers. And that's, that's the same, you know, throughout, throughout the nation. It's a we have um, we have a high number of children in, caught up in the child welfare system and not enough social workers and we need more CASA volunteers and we meet, need more uh, placements. So um, going back to that position that you mentioned in your office where they would be the one running or kind of working a tribal program with the local tribes, is that position still available? Do you think it will be available in the future? Um, what do you see for that position? That, um, I would like that position to start immediately as I have the funding. Right now, I still have some funding for it, but I mean, it, it costs between $40,000 to $50,000 um, 
to have a case supervisor, I would think that I would like to uh, offer a full time position with full with benefits for the tribal position. And so it's just dependent on the funding that I have, the grant funds that I have. So if any of the, you know, if any local tribes know of grant funds or any way that they could support that effort to fund a tribal position within the local CASA program, um, then it's easy for us to travel. So the other thing is that we, if we create a tribal program, um, a tribal CASA program, we, I think it is a really great opportunity to decide what we want that program to look like from the bottom up. Um, we, we can go by national cost of standards and compliances, but we also can develop it on our own for our own local community and what our local tribes want and need. And so that could include um, serving families. You know, we just need the, fun, the funding literally to put a person in that position and serve the local tribes. Another uh, okay. question here, um, which is, um, can CASAs also work on high conflict family law cases in tribal court? Um, and uh, Deborah, FYI, you've got your uh, go to connect uh, screen on the. Yep, there you go. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and again, that depends on the, the vision and mission of the local tribe. So, I mean, the local CASA program. So, the CASA program can expand their services, they have that option to do that. Okay, so that's very helpful. Um, so just for my clarification, this position that we were discussing earlier, um, you mentioned you, you're hoping to hire someone right away. Is it available right now? Do you have a job description that uh, people attending today could potentially get out there um, to people that may be interested? Or is it something that you're looking for the funding for again right now? Yeah, I had unfortunately I ha I had to hire someone. I had to spend down those grant funds because I had I received the funding from Boca to and some CDBG funding, but I had to spend those funds down. So I ended up hiring an outreach person. Um, but I'm always always trying to identify more funding to continue that position. So I have part of the funding right now. So I would need a, an additional like $20,000 to make to ensure that I have the funding. And the problem too is that um, luckily CASA programs are all getting VOCA funding right now. And so um, with this new VOCA funding, I'm hoping that I can bring on a second staff person. Um, and so we're just getting ready to enter into a new VOCA grant this next year. And so I will know in like just within a couple months if we're going to have more funding and the the only additional staffing I want to bring on is a tribal case supervisor. So that is the person I will be hiring. So right now today at this and uh, at this time, I do not have all the funds I need to hire that person. But my intent is that I will. OK. Got it. If, Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> if anyone knows of anybody, I mean, I had I had a really hard time searching for a staff person. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it was due to COVID this last year. So I would say if, you know, if anyone's interested or if they know someone, they should send them to me so that we could um, work on trying to get that position filled. Okay. So now um, if a tribe is able to work with your local program, I guess what would what what would you want the referral process to look like from tribal court to your organization? So how we right now how we operate is we have one CASA staff person who sits in court and we monitor all the cases right now. So we don't work off referrals. Um, we have either the judge or a social worker or an attorney may request a CASA on a case, which is often the case, like I said, we have 16 cases that have been requested right now, or the local CASA program identifies that, because um, part of the process is that we want to match the case with someone who's going to uh, be a good volunteer for that case. So if we have um, a volunteer who wants to advocate for a child who is about seven years old, we wouldn't necessarily assign that CASA to a teenager because it wouldn't be a good fit and it wouldn't be a good experience. And so we have to try to match them with, um, and that's part of the role of the local CASA program is that through the screening process, we identify who would be a best case, uh, the best case or a best fit for a child or uh, the volunteer. 
um, because we need this to be a good experience. And so uh, I got off track again, sorry. That's part of the, uh, the screening process or the process is to, what was the question? Um, I was just asking about the referral procedure. Oh, yes. Uh, how, would, how do you want to receive these referrals from a tribal court? If the tribal so court's trying to figure out how to create this program I, with you. Yeah. We definitely, we pro likely would not have the staffing to go sit in all of those court hearings like we do now and monitor all the cases. And so we would just need the, the tribal uh, court to send a referral over to CASA or send us a, um, just a request for a CASA. So we could develop um, a referral process. So first we could do, and that could be part of the MOU is that we, it states in there what the referral process would be. Um, so it would literally just be sending us the referral with the name and case number of the case. Okay. And then we would, um, then we would assign the CASA to the case and then we, we would at that time request, once it's signed from the judge, then we would re request the case file, all copies. And so sometimes that takes a couple weeks to receive all those copies and then we review the case. That's the first thing that we start doing is reviewing the case and then get in contact with the uh, tribal social worker. Okay, are there any more questions for Christine in the chat? No, okay. All right. And I would just say that, I mean, there's so much information and so much, um, so much more to know about the local CASA program and, and, you know, the process that I'm happy if anybody wants to contact me or give me a call and have a one on one chat. Okay. Well, thanks for being available and, you know, thanks for your interest in working with tribes. Um, we, we appreciate speaking to you today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So now just kind of moving on, um, you know, another option for tribal courts that are looking at getting guardian ad litems in their courtrooms, you know, California Indian Legal Services were available to assist. Um, if you're in California, we have four different offices throughout California. So we cover the state of California. So even if you're not in Northern California, um, there is a California Indian Legal Services that will be serving your area and you can contact them. Um, I have our information here for the Eureka office because I believe it's, it's mostly Northern California tribes that are attending here. But if your tribe is from a different area, go ahead and go to our website here. You can look up your local office. You can also contact us and we'll direct you to the correct office as well. Um, but we can help you develop programs, codes, ordinances, MOUs, develop training, give training. You know, we're available um, to provide a lot of support in courts that want to build these programs. Um, so that's about all I have, unless there's more questions out there. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention for um, tribes in Humboldt, I have been in contact with the Casa of Humboldt. Um, they just got a new executive director starting last week. Um, so she's kind of getting situated at the moment. Um, you know, they weren't able to participate in this um, training today, but they are interested in working with tribes too. Um, they kind of mentioned that their main issue in the past is that there are some tribes out in Eastern Humboldt um, and they lack CASAs in Eastern Humboldt because all the trainings occur in the Eureka area. So they've been trying to discuss and figure out how to get uh, more training in the Eastern area of Humboldt to attract more volunteers and people out there um, to eventually better serve tribes out in Eastern Humboldt. Um, but as I mentioned, the executive director is just so brand new, you know, we're not able to give any timelines on that, but that is their hope and desire. So they are wanting to work with tribes as well. Um, if you're a tribe that's not in Humboldt or Del Norte, uh, feel free to reach out to your local CASA and see um, if they're willing to partner with tribal courts. I believe many are able to partner as long as, you know, as Christine mentioned, as long as um, there's some support in place, there's volunteers that are available um, and, you know, 
the program can look into funds to help support any additional positions or training that would be needed to assist in working in tribal courts. Um, do we have any further questions at this time? Denise, I think you're talking, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I unmuted. Yeah, um, I don't see any questions right now, but I just wanted to um, comment um, at the end that I think um, Deborah did a really good job today going over different options that a tribe may utilize to get a gal or you know some an advocate in the tribal court to assist children or adults that may need additional support to communicate with the court. Um, and I think there's a lot of different types of tribes on the call right now, all operating at different capacities um, in different areas. Uh, you know, maybe a Title IV-E foster care program that's in the tribal system may want to utilize CASAs instead of some kind of MOU contract with the local county in your area or do it nationally. You know, I, I don't know what, you know, what your tri tribe can ultimately do, but that, you know, that could be an option. Um, there are other tribal courts that I've worked with that um, would really benefit from maybe a really, a smaller um, situation um, set up where you're appointing gals to appear on child support cases or just high conflict family law matters or tribal eviction proceedings. Um, some of the tribes that reached out to us already had their tribal ordinance written that the court set up the um, the standards for appointing gals, what, you know, Deborah was talking about. And, um, you know, it may take a little more time for that tribal system to maybe write up their policies and procedures of how they want to operate maybe a smaller program under its own regulatory authority for um, for these handful of cases. Um, I've been in some tribal court situations where it's just going nuts in the courtroom where it would, you know, it would be very helpful to the parties, the clerk, the court, everyone, if we had someone um, to assist um, the minor in, you know, a really high conflict situation. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I think if you review Deborah's slides, you'll see that she proposes all these different options. Um, that would be helpful to different types of tribal systems. And can I just jump on really quick and say that um, it, if we're talking about numbers, you know, if there's just a, if we haven't like the local CASA program for Del Norte County, if we have an MOU with either one of our local tribes and there's just a couple cases, um, we could easily serve those few cases. So I'm talking, I don't know what the intent, you know, what, how many cases some tribes may have. And if we're talking, 10 to 15 cases that's going to look different on that local CASA program's capacity to serve so if it's a small number i mean it for like look for del Norte county right now i think that there may be just a few cases and it would be easy to create an mou and for CASA to serve those cases okay thank you good to thank know you for following up one of the things um when I did contact National CASA um, Garden Ed Lightem, hold on, Association for Children, um, and spoke with Paige Beard, one of the things she did mention is that um, she has worked with tribes in creating these programs. And one of the things she mentioned is that the ones that have been successful and stuck around longer are the ones that have worked with local CASAs because local CASAs do have so many, they have their own resources. So she says those have been the ones that have been most successful and sustained the longest. So even if you are thinking about building um, your own tribal garden ad litem program or CASA program, it's also still beneficial to just kind of reach out to the CASA in your local area and state CASA just to kind of look at those options too and know what your backups are. Um, you know, and you may figure out that that may be a more sustainable way to go long term. Um, but, you know, definitely tribes can create their own programs completely separate um, from from anything in, with, 
involved with st the state or with their local causes. Thank you, Deborah. All right, thank you everyone for being here. I, I hope you all learned something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions still after this presentation. I think we will send out uh, my PowerPoint slides to all people that are, are attending. Um, I think there's also a request for that MOU that Del Norte County CASA can, um, can sign with a tribal court and modify for the tribal court's needs. We will look into sending that around too. I think there's also some requests um, for the National CASA Garden Ad Litem resources they have out there about creating your own tribal um, programs. I can send those out too. They also have a bunch of samples. I'll send those out as well. Um, if there's any additional information you like, you know, feel free to pop that in the chat and we can see we can send that to everyone um, after the presentation. There are a couple more questions in the chat, um, but I think I think we should just end it and and um, oh. answer those questions individually. Okay, and that's fine too. Um, I'm available for questions. I provided information how to contact all these programs. They're available for questions as well. All right, well, thank you everyone. Thanks for attending.